thank you very much for coming in today to, to share with us on this particular session. Uh, we're excited about the new information that we're putting together for 2014, and we're very excited to welcome presenters from Sacramento County and from Pima, Arizona, uh, to talk about the use of recovery support specialists uh, as we look at engagement and, and retention strategies in FCCs, and, and frankly, in child welfare and treatment practice more broadly. Um, these are things that we know are operational in sites that may not have a formal family drug court, but are, are putting together strategies to more effectively engage and uh, ensure that parents are retained in services. Uh, so let's move forward. The first thing up for today is a polling question. Uh, let's get that launched, Jonathan, and we're off and ready. All right. Uh, so first up. If a client is not following through or is non-compliant in a family drug court, the belief we hear sometimes is that they're not ready for, for substance abuse treatment. So to what extent do you agree with that, with that statement? So the vast majority um, say that that is uh, something that they disagree with. Uh, that they either strongly or disagree, and, and nobody actually strongly agrees with it as we look at those results. Uh, so I think that's good news because that's, a, that's something that we hear or perhaps used to hear uh, in child welfare and substance abuse practice. So we're excited that we can look at those issues of engagement and retention and look at those issues of readiness in, in new ways. Thinking treatment readiness. You know, I, I hope that many of you have had the opportunity to read the book by David Sheff called Clean. And he addresses this issue from the science of addiction uh, and thinking about what does that mean when we say that someone with a chronic brain disease uh, needs to hit rock bottom. And what does that mean to shift that thinking about addiction and readiness for treatment in the approach that it perhaps is an elevator and that we have opportunities and we have strategies to raise that bottom uh, to ensure that the uh, person who is in the throes, if you will, of this brain, this chronic brain disease, is able to engage in services. We hear often about, I think in some ways, the, the old notions, if you will, of treatment, that, uh, that this is tough love. Uh, and I think what David uh, so poignantly talks about in terms of uh, his own son is uh, that we wouldn't do this kind of tough love with other kinds of chronic diseases. And what does that mean in terms of tough love versus setting boundaries about what's acceptable for uh, that particular family, often from the parents of the person with the addiction perspective of, of needing to set boundaries about what's safe in their own home and what's safe for them to be able to take care of themselves. Um, if we think about raising the bottom, uh, how do we have realistic expectations? How do we do contract uh, contingency contracting? so that we're aware of the neurochemical effects, uh, as well as the challenges of early recovery, as well as being able to set those boundaries to increase somebody's uh, readiness, uh, and making sure that we recognize that recovery occurs in the context of relationships with other people. And I think as all of us recognize, often those relationships, particularly with their family, particularly with their children, have been fractured. Uh, and yet knowing that that healing has to take place in the context of those family relationships and the relationships for that community in thinking about how do they engage parents in care. So will they come? We've built a family drug court. We've made a referral from the child welfare office, go to treatment. What does that mean in terms of the effectiveness of family drug courts if we're focused on effective engagement? 
This reminds me that some, you know, more than 15 years ago, as the federal government uh, created blending perspectives and building common ground, uh, two of the key national goals that they set were ensuring timely access to effective substance abuse services and engaging and retaining parents in care. So this fits very much with a national goal from quite some time ago. The good news is, is that we have not only research about this, but you'll hear from real experts in the nation about how to do this idea of effective engagement in services. We know that recovery support specialists or engagement specialists or ways in which different communities have named this role of trying to ensure that there is effective outreach and engagement strategies. There are various ways in which communities have named that and more importantly, I think, thought about what the role is that they need in their community. So a liaison, who is really the, the person who is brokering or the person who is making sure that those ancillary supports are in place, they're identifying the service gaps for the family. The, again, the broker that facilitates that access, making sure that the barriers to the individual being able to complete the screening, assessment, engagement, retention process, and that is a, a continuum and a process, that there's someone that is addressing the barriers and making sure that the local resources that are available are in place for that particular family. Often that broker is the person who's responsible to monitor the participant's progress and the compliance with the treatment plan. They often are the person who's entering the case data uh, in the context of the family drug court. Then there's also the role of recovery support specialists that are act as advisors, uh, that they educate child welfare in the larger community. They're looking for that larger community support for their initiatives. Uh, they're the ones that may be calling the team meetings, communicating, and making sure that uh, all of the various partners have the information that they need uh, to make timely and informed uh, decisions and particularly inform judicial decisions. So thinking about those functions brings up, again, what are the differences in the titles and the various models? And what we think is important is perhaps not so much the title, but if your particular family drug court is asked, what does our program what do our parents, what do our families and our community need in order to effectively engage parents in this change process? Can we recognize what's going on in those early days of abstinence, perhaps not yet recovery, but those early days of the crisis and for the family, either the child has been removed from their care or they are continuing with the children living in their home, but that there is a significant issue that needs to be addressed so that uh, we don't need to place that child. So these various roles and titles and models are used often interchangeably. We think it's important, again, not so much what title you choose, but making sure that you're aware of the skill set that you're looking for about if this is somebody that is, has experiential knowledge to share with families, or is it somebody who moves into a different role for the court, for the family drug court, for the treatment provider, that has that experiential knowledge and expertise, and also some specialized training uh, in outreach and engagement in substance abuse services uh, to make sure that those components in your program are effective. We thought it would be helpful to also talk about and to make sure that everyone is aware of the different purposes and what's trying to be achieved with recovery specialists. Uh, and again, going back to your community and your purpose and your needs, 
thinking about the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. Is this about decreasing the time to access and enter treatment? Is it about improving the outreach and engagement component? Is it about increasing the permanent placement outcomes at 12 months, the reunification rate, the decreasing the time in out-of-home care? Thinking clearly about what you're trying to achieve sort of backs you up into what are those roles and responsibilities and the functions that we need to put in place in order to achieve those outcomes. So these are all linked together, and many of you are experts already at looking at those uh, community conditions, the programmatic strategies you're putting in place, and the outcomes that you're trying to achieve in a logic model kind of approach. And that's what we're trying to lay out in this presentation, this part of the presentation, as you think about your community needs the roles and responsibilities, what you're trying to achieve, and what kinds of outcomes you hope to be able to achieve, and more importantly, perhaps, is to, to count and to monitor and to make decisions about those program strategies based on those uh, outcomes that you achieve and the data that you're able to, to uh, collect. Again, thinking about the roles. If you're needing to build the linkages and improve the communication and the collaboration between the systems, you may need somebody who's acting as that formal liaison. They're responsible for engaging community support uh, and enhancing the relationship with your community providers. If the purpose is to improve the parent's access to assessment and to treatment, perhaps the role that you need is a treatment broker. Somebody who's, who's very acquainted, knowledgeable about the services that are available in your community, um, has that ability to pick up the phone and say to the different treatment providers, or perhaps that, that they need a spot for a family member, or perhaps even the sophistication of saying that there is a data set, a database that's available so that they're able to link a person in need with a particular opening uh, in the community. Perhaps the purpose that you need is the ability for child welfare and the court staff to manage the caseloads uh, in which substance abuse is a factor, and that you need somebody who's acting more as an advisor to, to practice. We see this in outstationing substance abuse counselors with investigative units, uh, that they are somebody that can be relied on to advise and to uh, go out perhaps with the investigator on a case. So again, thinking through what are the outcomes you're trying to achieve, what are the needs in the community, should be driving what kind of recovery specialist role, what kind of outreach role, what kind of broker role uh, you need within your own community. We know that there's typically, not these are not exclusive, but typically the court makes three kinds of requirements in a case plan. And depending on your jurisdiction, if this is a formal court order or if it is assumed in the child welfare case plan, but typically it's about having contact with that person who's managing the recovery component of the case, having treatment uh, plan and completing that treatment plan, that there is some requirement for drug and alcohol testing and screening on an ongoing basis, and some reco uh, recovery support group requirement for the parent to participate in. Those three standard court orders are often the role that the brokers, the liaisons, the recovery support specialists can fill. But it's important to think about those functions in terms of what kind of background and expertise you're looking for, where in fact that person is going to be located. If it's about immediate engagement or immediate assessment, we know that if it's a bus right away, uh, that it's a, a pretty hard to get from the court to the bus to where that location is, uh, where that specialist is located. So we see in various uh, communities, ways in which they're bringing that staff member into the courthouse, or you'll hear about some models that, that they're in close proximity 
uh, to look at those ability to get from one place to another within your jurisdiction. And we recognize that sometimes this is a particular challenge in the rural communities that transportation, even in big cities, the transportation is often a factor about how that individual is to get from place to place and service provider to provider. And then recognizing that the key uh, consideration of how all of this gets communicated, uh, that reduces the noise between the systems, reduces the noise between workers, and increases the efficiency of that communication between the systems. As we think about what these various roles and responsibilities are, one of the strategies that we have seen uh, used very effectively is what we refer to as a drop-off analysis between these various points in time in which a family member interacts with child welfare, with the court, with the treatment provider, how do we know the numbers of how many individuals were supposed to go through each of these steps and how many actually went through those steps? If you haven't done a drop-off analysis in your community and you're thinking about what this engagement and retention role might look like, we'd encourage you to be in touch with us that we might be able to help you to look at those data and to help drive some of those decisions about the programmatic response uh, based on data. We also know that there are some new data that are available now in jurisdictions that have put these kinds of programs in place. In particular, looking at program strategies that use parent support and family drug courts. And we're delighted to be able to share some of those data with you. These are primarily from uh, the regional partnership grant programs that had a program strategy that included a family drug court and, uh, and those that did not have a family drug court. So you see the length of time in terms of the median days in treatment based on the various kinds of case management or engagement kind of function that these various programs put in place. And you see that when there was intensive case management, which was often what was going on with either the specialized recovery specialist or a unit of social workers in child welfare that were providing that intensive level of case management to families, uh, and what was termed recovery coaches, um, that the median days in treatment hit 200 days. Um, and the various kinds of ways in which those program outreach and those engagement programs were put in place. We also know that from some of these last, uh, I'm sorry, from some of these program strategies that at, if we look at the discharge from substance abuse treatment after the parent was enrolled in the regional partnership grant by parent support strategy, that the combination of intensive case management and recovery coaches also had an effect in if they completed or if they completed or transferred to another program. And you see the total number in the in the parentheses, but that 63% of those parents who received intensive case management and recovery coaching uh, were able to have a successful treatment uh, uh, final status, if you will, when they left the treatment program. It's not to say that that's the only consideration, but we think it's important for, again, to back up to the community needs, to the kinds of strategies you can put in place, to the outcomes you're trying to achieve, and to look at ways in which you'll be able to collect those data to be able to look at the effects of these kinds of programs. All right, so I can hear folks out there saying, great, sounds terrific. How do we fund this? And we're going to walk through a few little steps, but again, we would encourage you to be in touch with us if this is something that you're looking at about the kinds of funding strategies or TA resources uh, that we've put together in the past. So first, what's the job description? What are you trying to, uh, to do with your particular program? What are the current funding sources for 
that particular component. The case management that happens within child welfare, a case management that happens within substance abuse treatment, and what's been the best match of the way in which those services are currently being funded in your community and what you're trying to achieve. When we look at those in terms of the current and future opportunities, we, we would ask you, do an inventory. Who's paying for that now? These are often not services that are add-on. They're often a way in which you think about the current way in which case management, case coordination is currently happening, and who's doing that? Is this somebody that has the skill set in order to move forward with doing these kinds of specialized roles. It means that you're negotiating with those funders about the, the outcomes that they want to see and who the priorities are to get those services. While we recognize that this is a bit of a dated resource, some of those pieces about this monograph on funding family-centered treatment for women with substance use disorders, many of those sources have not changed, even though it's a, it's a publication that came out in 2008. And I think we're, we're aware of those kinds of things that have changed, particularly the, the effects that the Affordable Care Act will have as more individuals have access to health insurance and perhaps if you're in a state uh, that is expanding Medicaid to what that looks like in terms of uh, case management services that are available in those other funding streams. But again, we want you to look at this as a way of thinking about those resources. Part of what this monograph does is to look at the major federal funding streams and the kinds of services that you're looking for for adults and identifies what are those federal sources that are available to fund these kinds of services as well as for children. So a variety of funding sources on the adult side as well as on the child side. So we would ask you to take stock of all of those options and then think about what are your best bets? Where are the resources most significant? What new flexibility might be available in changes that have happened in your own state or uh, community? And then who is around that's a champion about the in ways in which funding can be integrated or may already exist to fund those particular services in your family drug court. We also want to draw your attention to a monograph that came out, again, a little bit ago, but um, still is relevant in thinking about these issues of what kind of case management, what kind of resource do you need in terms of a program specialist the linkage, the broker, the outreach specialist. Um, we document some case studies about how a few, six states in particular, look at these issues and put programs in place in order to provide substance abuse specialists in child welfare practice. All right, we're back to a polling question. Uh, Jonathan, let's see if we can launch this question. And uh, does your site currently use a substance abuse specialist as an engagement and retention strategy. All right, so less than half are using a specialist at present. Um, there's a similar strategy for about 10% of you uh, and about almost 20%, one in five of you that about that are moving in that direction. So we're, we're delighted that you're on this webinar today. Uh, and we look forward to having any questions, further questions that you may have as you explore this, uh, come to us for, for our responses. And with that, let me turn things over to uh, our friend in Sacramento County who has been running a specialist program for some time now, uh, Tiana Roy. Thank you so much for joining with us today to share your knowledge about uh, these kinds of services. And I will turn things over to, you, to Tiana. Thank you. Oh, one, one moment, Tiana. You're, you're still muted. We're going to ask you to re start from the beginning. OK, there you go. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Young, and thank you everyone for logging in today and showing an interest in this topic. It means that you are on the right track, so good job. So I'm here today to talk about the Sacramento County experience, and I'm going to move to the next slide. So basically, to summarize, STARS in Sacramento County, which stands for Specialized Treatment and Recovery Services, um, was created in June 2001 to improve reunification rates in Sacramento County. Basically, we provide the alcohol and drug case management to clients involved in the Child uh, Protective Services. And I'm going to go into more detail on that in later slides. So let me tell you about the nightmare that existed before 2001. Reunification rates were about 18%. So doing the math, that means that 82% of children were not returning home. So let's first think about the cost to the children. The cost of the children that were waiting in foster care, that were wondering if their parents were going to get it together, and not only the cost to the children and the trauma that was involved in that, but also the cost to the county. The cost of the county of paying for the children to be in care, paying for the attorneys, paying for the court system in order to help get these parents into the treatment that they needed. But basically, during that time, parents were unable to access the substance abuse treatment that they needed. What, what was happening was that they were either handed a list or handed a phone book and said, you know, get yourself into treatment and we'll see you back here in six months. Make sure you get it together and we'll, we'll need to see some progress by that time. Well, if you think of the clients that we serve and how many years have they been using substances and, and just getting up and being able to get their kids to school in a day it was difficult. So to think that they can navigate through that treatment process, that's the reason why, part, you know, for a good majority of them, that the reunification rates were so low. Because if they weren't able to get themselves into drug treatment, none of the other aspects on their case plan were being addressed. Because if you don't address that primary issue, then you're not going to be successful in your parenting class. You're not going to be successful in getting out of that domestic violence relationship. So. Um, because of that, they would show up to their six-month review, and there was insufficient services. They weren't able to get into drug treatment. There was too long of waiting lists. They, they weren't able to maintain the waiting list. So they would extend it out again and again until sometimes people were in reunification services for more than two years. At the same time, social workers, attorneys, the courts, they were all uninformed on the parents' progress. There was a lack of trust as well. Um, all parties involved uh, felt that they weren't being told by the providers if the clients had a relapse. There was a huge disconnect on the progress that would delay the court. You weren't able to get the drug testing uh, information on time. They didn't know how many treatment sessions they, they attended. It was just a mess. Um, the drug testing wasn't uniform and the results were delayed. So, for example, a social worker would show up at a client's house and say, you know what, there is something going on with you right now. I need you to go and drug test. So they would send the client to go and drug test at the lab, and they sometimes wouldn't receive a result back for a few weeks. So in the meantime, you may or may not have the children in the home, but at the same time, they are going to see and have their visitation. So there was just too much delay in the drug testing component. So um, there we go. Now. Because of the SARS and Dependency Drug Court program, the results that we have, reunification rates across the board are at 47%. 71% for those parents graduating the Dependency Drug Court. So for those statistic majors out there, you know that this level of increase is amazing. Not only that, but reunification is occurring, fa occurring faster. So the time in foster care is shorter because services are happening quicker. So when they're going back to their six-month review, there has been significant progress. They have treatment on demand. What does that mean? So that means that a parent can attend their detention hearing, get referred to, get an assessment by the STARS program, get quickly into the level of treatment that they need, and they're able to, at the start, engage and get connected with their recovery specialist. So their, their treatment, their process begins almost at day one. It's amazing. All parties are involved in the case. They're informed at every stage of treatment. So there's no more guesswork. Everyone is sent a report twice a month that explains, that details the progress for the client. The, and, and also, 
If parents received random drug testing, it's instant. So if a, if a client tests positive, a social worker is going to be informed of that within the hour. Within the hour. That's the level of urgency that we know that a social worker needs to be made aware of because they may have their kids in the home. They may be about to go and see their kids on an unsupervised visit. So we need to make sure that everyone is fully aware. So the recovery specialist completes all aspects of testing, and it, it's not only benefiting from knowing that, that the results are instant, but also knowing what behaviors to look for. So if a client looks suspicious, they're sweating, they're nervous, they're fidgety, um, but yet they're testing negative, we know that something's going on. So we may decide, you know what, we're going to go ahead and test you again. This time we may use a hat, this time we may use a mouth swab, just because the behaviors aren't matching the test. And, um, and any test that's being disputed gets sent to the lab for confirmation. So although we do use the instant screen, the client may say, no, no, absolutely not. I did not use. No problem. We're going to go ahead and send this to the lab, and we're going to get it back for confirmation. So our goal, we want to assist the parents in the process of recovery by removing barriers to treatment, providing support encouragement, and accountability. Let's talk about barriers for a minute. Barriers include confusion, fear of making an intake, uncertain of how to even get to a treatment program. Our recovery specialist will set up the appointment. They'll describe the program. Let's alleviate some fears. You don't have to worry. Let me tell you what residential is like. Let me tell you what to expect in outpatient. They'll map out the car or the bus route to get there. So that's removing barriers, but let's talk about encouragement. Let's talk about encouragement for a minute. Let's imagine if you went to the doctor and you were told, you know what, you, your health is in serious jeopardy. You have to immediately start working out and changing your diet and everything else, right? So, okay, I'm scared now. I need to go and get to the gym. You make it to the gym. You walk in there. It's huge. You've never been to one before, and you see all of this equipment there. You don't know what works with what. You don't know how to get started. So you're nervous. You walk in. Everybody around you seems like they have it together, but you don't. So you may start, you know, get a little machine here, might do a couple of dumbbells here. But basically, if you don't get engaged right away, you're going to get discouraged, and you're going to leave. So what if at the moment that you walked in the door, someone met you, a personal trainer, a personal recovery coach that said, hi, I am so glad you're here. I know that it's overwhelming. I know. Let me show you how to do it. Let me see exactly what it is that you need, and let me walk you through this process. And for any of you that have had a personal trainer, it's not just about showing you how to get through something, but also there are going to be times when you're right in the middle of it that you want to give up. It's hard. You want to give up. And that personal trainer says, no, just a little bit more, just a little bit more. You can do this. They're encouraging you along the way. Not only that, but someone to answer the phone in the evening, let's continue on with this analogy here, when you want to sit down in front of the TV and eat a, eat a box of cookies, right? So instead, you call this person and say, you know what, I'm really feeling weak right now. I need some help. Someone's there to answer that and encourage you and say, you know what, don't give up. You can do this. So that's basically what we do. We are there to motivate, to encourage, to show them how to navigate this very confusing system. Not only that, but accurately reporting each client's progress to the child welfare system and the court with a, with a commitment to compassion that is key, integrity, utmost integrity. We can no longer have that distrust that's between systems and excellence. So our recovery specialist, just to break it down for you, what do we do here in Sacramento County? Well, for one, they are in recovery, and they're role models. So they model the program of recovery, that integrity, the dedication and commitment. Professional, their appearance and otherwise. How do they speak to other entities? Do they dress professionally? How do they act with clients? We need to be professional. They are certified addiction specialists, or if we do get them sometimes from school, they have to be, obtain their certification within a certain small time frame. So part of the reason that um, sometimes people have some hesitancy with utilizing recovery specialists because they are fearful of how much self-disclosure do you go into. And so that all goes back to training. 
There, our recovery specialists are trained to utilize limited self-disclosure. We're not going into these gory details about who they knew and, and how much they used or anything like that, but to share about that pain and desperation that I know that it's overwhelming right now. I know that the first thing that you want to do because you're feeling pain is to go to what's going to numb that pain, and that's not okay. There's another way to really show them, but not with this full-on self-disclosure that talks about how down deep they went themselves. Sometimes personal examples are warranted, and that's okay as well, but we always want to ensure limited self-disclosure. We require a minimum of two years sobriety. There's other sites that require more. Ours, we found that two years sobriety is sufficient. They've gone through um, their, their certification process. They've been able to maintain that. And a lot of times, people coming out of those and their early recovery are just on fire. I mean, that's just the bottom line. They're on fire. We need to make sure that our recovery specialists are teachable. They have to have a teachable attitude. Um, we have a philosophy here. We have a manner in which we treat clients. And for example, we provide help no matter what. We want to break down that old school treatment ideal that, that Nancy did talk about that, um, you know, they aren't ready until they hit bottom. So that's a lot of times what some treatment or even the 12-step community will say, and hopefully we're moving towards a different angle because honestly, this wasn't their idea. They didn't want CPS to knock on their door. They didn't want the court or anyone to say, hey, check it out, you have a problem, you need to get into recovery. So obviously, they are not ready. We have to meet them where they are and know that we can push them towards readiness. That's our philosophy. We can help push them towards readiness. And um, for example, if they get discharged from treatment because of a relapse, we pick them up. We make sure that there is no breach in between where they can say, you know, forget this. I knew that I was going to fail anyway. I don't have a chance now. No, we make sure, you know, let's learn from this relapse. What did you learn from this? Obviously, something wasn't working for you. Can we, let's talk about this. So there's not that old school, will come back and, and call me when you're finally ready to do it. We don't have time for that. The kids don't have the time for that. They are waiting for their parents to get it together. So excuse the very text heavy slides here, but I know there was a lot of questions on what was the specific duty. So this is coming straight out of our policies and procedures, out of our job description. So I want to just read it through to you. Recovery specialists are going to provide services and locations that meet the needs of the client. So this is anywhere. We will meet our clients anywhere within the county. So if that means at home, in the correctional settings, in the hospitals, anywhere, we'll meet them at a gas station if that's where they're willing to meet us so that we can tell them, we're going to make sure that you know that I'm here for you, and if this is where we got to have our contact, and this is where we have to have our contact. We remove the barriers. We remove the excuses, too. Recovery specialists are responsible for maintaining client records, and basically that anything that happens, if it's a test, if it's a contact, um, if it's a call to the social worker or treatment provider, it's documented. Everything must be documented in the client file because it's going to tell the story. It's going to tell the story of the client's reunification process. A key, a key duty is that recovery specialists are required to treat all clients with respect and dignity and refrain, refrain from any conflict. So even when they push our buttons, even when um, they are being less than respectful, we are the professionals. They need to be treated with dignity and respect. We have to meet them where they're at, and sometimes that means that they came from a really, really dark place. But all we're concerned about is how are we going to get you out of that dark place. I'm not here to judge you on how dark that place was. I'm here to say that there's somewhere that's a lot lighter. Recovery specialists are required to perform supervised alcohol and drug testing. So basically, we use testing as a therapeutic intervention. It's not punitive. We're not trying to catch you or make you admit to using. Um, basically, we know that this is a necessary process. We, that, that's a huge proof that you're able to maintain your sobriety. But at the same time, um, we can use that as an intervention. If someone tests positive on a cup and they're not admitting, we don't have to, this is showing positive, and I already know that you use, and your behaviors say it too. That's not why we're there. We're there to say, you know what, OK, well, if you're disputing it, no problem, we're going to send it to the lab, but here's what I'm going to tell you. 
part of recovery is getting on it. And the only time that we can truly make progress is that we get honest with ourselves and go beyond that fear of what's keeping us from getting honest, and that way we can, we can have better results that way. And I'm going to tell you what, coming at it from that angle is going to get you way more results than from demanding an admission out of someone. Recovery specialists are required to perform an alcohol and drug assessment if a change in treatment is needed. So basically, higher levels are often needed. If a relapse occurs or someone just gets a little bit more honest about how often they were using. And sometimes they might complete residential treatment and they need to go into an outpatient treatment. So our recovery specialists do those alcohol and drug assessments as needed. Recovery specialists are required to provide support and encouragement. We talked about those. But back to the personal trainers, we don't give up. I am right here with you. If you storm, if, so if a client, and this happens, I just saw this happen yesterday. If a client storms out of the office because they tested positive or they just you know, they feel like they're not getting anywhere, they're failing, and, and they just, they want to give up. And they even might even say, I just, my kids don't even need me, I just give up. Well, instead of just letting them run out of the office, we go after them. We go after them, because they're going to expect us to just let them go. And I'm going to tell you what, when we catch them in the parking lot, and we're able to defuse the situation and have them come back in, and let's talk calmly about this, we get so many more dramatic results. But if we were to let them go, now sometimes, here's what I'm going to say, sometimes there's no talking to them. And they, we do have to let them go. And then we'll call them later and we'll hopefully that they've calmed down. But I'm tell you what, us going after them shows them, we're not giving up on you. You can't give up on your kids. You can't give up on yourself. We're required to collect all documentation. So that means support group and treatment verification. Um, we arrange and facilitate case conferences between the client, the treatment provider, the social worker within the 90 days of intake. This is really critical. So if you're not currently doing a case conference, here's what you have to know. Sometimes clients may staff split. They may tell their social worker something. They may tell their treatment provider something else. Or they may just not be on track. Pulling together a case conference to get everyone in the same room to talk about specific goals gets everyone on the same page. It removes yet another barrier of miscommunication. We can turn it around within the first 60 days of someone being non-compliant and get everyone on the same page. Let's get some real tangible ways that we can turn this around right here, right now, and so that the next four months before your review, you can get it together. Case conferences are critical. We're required to document reports of a client's progress twice a month. So. Basically, we address the four areas of SARS compliance. One is the contacts, face-to-face -face contacts. In the beginning, when a client's new, we, get, they, we, we see them twice a week. We want to establish a really strong relationship with them in the beginning. And as they go through the program and as they continue on, um, their, their contacts get less and less. But that's documented. Did they show up or did they not show up? Testing. Did they test positive or negative? Treatment. Did they attend treatment or did they not? And their support groups, it's the same. Did they attend the required number of support groups or did they not? So our reports are very black and white. They're either compliant or they're non-compliant. There's no guesswork. There's no, well, they, they missed two, but here's the reason why. No, it's either black and white, you did it or you didn't do it. So let's go on to a really fun part and talk about hiring. How do you hire for a recovery specialist in your area. And these are this is my favorite subject because I do all the hiring for our program. And so one, let's have some passion like this lady here. Uh, are they motivated to motivate change? You can have someone that has a great resume. They have tons of experience. They, they um, have all these credentials and everything else. And yet when they're sitting in front of you, they are as plain as day. They do not. They don't have passion within them. So when I'm talking about can you motivate change into someone, are you even motivated yourself? So that's one of my key things that I look for. And then professional experience. So work history, internships, volunteering. This is a complicated position. If you're dealing with the courts, this is not just providing treatment. This is way more to it than that. So do they have the time management skills in order to accomplish that? And the basic understanding to do it well. So that professional experience helps give you a glimpse on how much have they done so far. Professionalism is also very critical. When you're dealing with the courts, you want to have someone that represents your company well. 
separation from that client mentality. How do they present to you? How did they show up to the interview? Were they dressed professionally? Um, how did they speak? Were they appropriate? How was their attitude? How was their mannerisms? Can you tell by their mannerisms that they have clean time? That's all very important. When I mean the referral system works best, it's from your other employees. When you have employees that have bought into how important this job is and what type of person that it takes to be able to do it well, they're only going to refer the best. So you want other people to refer. You know what, I know someone, they're working over here, they would be great at this. That's, that's how we get our best employees, is by the referral system. And then utilize your probationary period. Sometimes people just aren't a fit. Even with extensive training, you can give them extensive training and they might not have the skills. So you're not doing them or your agency a favor by trying to make it a fit. Basic attitudes and beliefs that we need when we're hiring someone is that they need to not believe, that was kind of funny the way I said it, but basically that denial and resistance must be smashed or that a client has to be totally ready to change. So we talked about their readiness earlier and how we have to help that along. Meeting them where they are means accepting that sometimes they, not, they may not be ready to admit. Um, we don't have to beat it out of them. Um, we already have the confirmation from the lab. We already know that it's a positive test. They are going to get ready when they're ready, when that fear and everything else is behind them, when they're truly in that stage of their recovery program. It doesn't mean that they haven't made any progress. It just means that they're not there yet. So dancing and not wrestling. We don't engage in arguments. Um, Clients may want to wrestle, but instead we use motivational interviewing, and that helps us to effectively dance with them. So we're not going to engage in these you know, roundabout, let's blame here, let's blame that. We're going to continuously redirect, redirect, and redirect. Bring them back to the reason why they say they want to get clean in the first place. Bring them back to the reason why um, their children love them. A person who works for us, or whom you would want to hire as well, has to truly believe in client change and transformation non-judgmental, ability to meet them where they are. So we can never, and if you were to read my notes, you would know that I put that in bold, we can never predict who will make it and who won't. So basically, we must act as if anyone's going to be able to make it. We cannot give up on them. And if we do, then why wouldn't they give up on themselves? So if we were to give up on them, then why wouldn't they give up on themselves? So again, somebody might come in and we're like, oh man, this person, they are not going to get past the first week. And I'm going to tell you what, they stand up at graduation and they prove us wrong again and again and again. So some of the negatives that can happen, and it's important to mention here because people have often said, well, what if, what if one of them relapsed? What if an employee relapses? Yes, it does happen. It does. It can happen and it does happen. Um, and it is very difficult. If someone stops taking care of themselves and their own personal recovery, it suffers. And um, we have a zero tolerance policy if it happens. I mean, that's just the bottom line. There are steps that we can do. We want to make sure, and I'll go into the next slide, but it does happen. And yes, employees do make ethical mistakes. But at the same time, so do social workers, so do attorneys, and anyone else in the world. So sometimes they're learning lessons and sometimes they're grounds for termination. It just really depends. So out of those two negatives, it does happen, but yet it is worth the risk. It has been proven. So even despite these possibilities, it's worth doing it. How do we check for those negatives to happen? How do we prevent those things from happening, or how do we know? So basically, employees need to have random and suspected drug testing. I mean, that just should be happening automatically and follow up on all accusations. Sometimes we'll get a call from a treatment provider or even from a client. You know, I think that my recovery specialist is, is acting weird or, and whether we believe it or not, no problem. Let's go send them the drug test. Document the resolution because a lot of times it's just somebody trying to get back on them or somebody having a bad day, but automatically referring to a test helps remove that suspicion. Being on the alert for other behaviors. So if someone's missing work, having a lot of health issues, not to say that that's not legitimate, but a lot of times that's what people will fall back on if they have relapsed, and making regular mistakes. So 
if you have a file review system in place, somebody needs to be regularly checking in with all employees. So that way we have this ongoing monitoring. That's really critical. Trainings, trainings, and more trainings. You have to make them the experts in the field. Have regular staff meetings. Introduce webinars. Bring in speakers. Help get them and keep them motivated. Because it can be a very difficult job. We're dealing with client crisis constantly. We're dealing with, with people at their lowest, and it can be draining. It can be draining to help get someone from the point of when they first walk into that gym to the point of when they're fit. And so in order for us to do that, we have to regularly help motivate them and keep them strong. But basically, we don't want to compromise your agency's integrity. If something has happened, relapse or certain ethical dilemmas, there is no room to compromise the reputation of your agency. You have to separate employment. At least that's what we do, um, because everything's at stake. So as a take home, as a way to kind of sum up what I'm doing here, recovery specialists break down the trust barriers unlike anyone else. This is what we're talking about today. They can, it happens all the time. Um, clients sometimes don't even want to listen to you until they're sure that you've been through what they've been through. And sometimes they'll just take one look at you. You don't know what you're talking about. You never use. And so they automatically will put up a wall. They'll put up a wall that says, you can't reach me because you've never been there. You don't know what it feels like to have a craving. And so with a recovery specialist, they can break down and, and just, just forge through that wall like nobody else. Not only that, but they can spot deception and manipulation and confront it from a non-threatening angle. Recovery specialists are in meetings. So if someone is trying to forge meeting slips, yes, it does happen, then we can catch that. You know, we, we know the tricks. We know how sometimes they're going to try to use a device. We, those are the things that we can look for because they, they might have done it themselves. A recovery specialist that we've hired might have gone through the system themselves and tried all of those things too. And so the lies and the manipulation, they're so easy to spot when you've done it yourself. And so those are the ways that you can come confront it in a non-threatening way that says, really? Really? You're going to try to tell me that? So they can motivate change. Recovery specialists can motivate change. It is unbelievable what will happen when you see people standing up at graduation and say, you know, I wouldn't have made it without my recovery specialist because they believed in me when I couldn't believe in myself. And that's what we're talking about here, is that really coming from a non-threatening, non-judgmental area and, and helping someone have belief in themselves and reminding them that your kids love you and they are waiting. They are waiting for you to do this and you can do it. So to talk about how it's, it's grown for us is basically we began with three recovery specialists and now we're at 32. Sacramento County is a big county. At any given time we have 500 clients. And um, so we're dealing with two drug courts that are really large. I know there's a lot of counties out there that might be going, oh, that's not like us, so this can't possibly fit our program. Take what can apply and know that, that this, this can work. We started with three, so we started small, but the need and, the, and the, the change and all the statistics and everything just show that we need to expand. And so that's what's happened over the years is that now we are so systemized in the child welfare system that it, we, we couldn't do it without each other. And so with that, I'm going to turn everything back over to Dr. Young and so that she can introduce Pima County. So thank you, everyone, for listening to me today. And uh, hopefully everything works out for you. Yana, thank you so much. Before you uh, close out just right now, I have a couple questions that came in. And first let me just comment. I mean, that your presentation was fabulous. And it really helped in this idea about rethinking readiness. Uh, the go get them, the meeting the, the meeting the parents in the in the parking lot. I mean, that go get them strategy is just so, so wonderful. So thank you so much for sharing it. A couple questions that came in. One, I think you, you sort of implied, uh, do you hire former clients? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, it's not specific to it, but by the, since we've been in existence since 2001, there's been a lot of graduates over the years who have gone back to school and have that personal experience. So while not everyone has been involved in child welfare, we do have a number of them that have. Are there complications or personnel kinds of issues with child welfare about having formal former clients, or does that have to get worked out somehow? 
None whatsoever. None whatsoever. Because we have a two-year clean time limit, they actually, Child Welfare in Sacramento County likes to use their own um, parent mentors as well. And so um, we haven't had a problem with it at all. Great. All right. Um, another question. Who certifies your specialist? So we have, I would say, I think four different schools in Sacramento County that are specialized in addiction certification. So two of our community colleges, and we have um, two other institutes that also offer certification. Okay, so they could be in any one of those four kinds of certification programs um, to be able to be qualified? Yes. Okay, terrific. Um, and then we have one that's a little bit, um, a, a little different, a different path on this one. You mentioned that the recovery specialists actually do the drug testing. I, I think that what's implied in the question is, how does that change the relationship between the recovery specialist and the parent? Um, how, do you, how do you work with that when you're trying to build relationship and yet this is the person who's monitoring for the court or monitoring for child welfare? How do you work with that? You know, that's a good question, but the reason why it's not an issue is because it's established from the very beginning. That this is, if this is the nature of our relationship, well, I'm going to support and encourage you. This is part of the process. And, um, and sometimes it's actually better because there is more of a comfort level with a recovery specialist than there would be with someone at a lab. And so um, it doesn't change the nature of the relationship. But here's what I will say. Here's what has come up. So where sometimes the client might feel very, very comfortable with their recovery specialist, and if they have had a relapse, they might even attempt to say, don't tell my social worker, please, you know, um, you know, we have it like that. And the recovery specialist has said from the very beginning, no, that is not, we are, that is not what we're about. They, we have to at all times have integrity and trust. And what I'm going to do is I will sit here with you and we can call your social worker together. So sometimes there may be a little bit of comfort where a client might think they can manipulate, but that never happens. Um, but comfort levels never really do change. It's from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thank you again so much, Tiana. Uh, we're going to turn, turn things over to our friends in Pima County. Uh, and first, let me just run through who we'll be hearing from. Uh, oh, let me back up. You saw that slide about uh, more information about Sacramento and the STARS program on the web, mm -hmm. on the blog spot. So familydrugcourts.blogspot.com. We encourage you to visit that and to ask any additional questions, and we can have uh, Tiana respond to those and follow up and post those on the blog if you have other questions that we didn't get to today uh, specific for, for Tiana. So as we turn things to our uh, Arizona partners, uh, Maureen Accurso, who is the Family Drug Court Coordinator, Andy Mendoza, who is a Recovery Support Specialist, and Yesenia Campos, who's the Senior Recovery Specialist for the Prima County Family Drug Court. Thanks so much for joining us today, and we look forward to your presentation. Maureen? You, yes, I'm here. Thank you, Dr. Young. Um, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, we're really, really um, pleased to be here this afternoon, and uh, we're looking forward to presenting our webinar today. Um, so to start off, uh, my name is Marina Curso. I'm actually the Family Drug Court Supervisor, um, and I have the honor and pleasure of supervising. Oh, my slides aren't working. There we go. There we go. Hold on a minute. My slides weren't working very well there. Something I need to go back. Great. <laughs> Sorry, people. Okay. Here we go. All right, as I said, my name is Marina Cursor. I'm the supervisor, um, family drug court supervisor, um, and I have the honor and pleasure of supervising our certified recovery support specialist. Um, first of all, I'm going to give a brief um, overview of our family drug court program. Um, we first conducted a pilot back in 2001, um, and in that pilot, uh, we used one zip code and one CPS unit. Um, a couple of years later, um, we decided to open up Family Drug Court to two other zip codes. And a couple of years after that, we realized that um, Family Drug Court was a program that um, parents really needed. And so we decided to open it up to the, um, the rest of Tucson area. Um, and we're still going strong 13 years later. 
um, we're, we're still um, available for parents who need us. And part of our Family Drug Corps comes in three phases. It's about an eight-month program. Um, that's if they go through it with uh, complete compliance. In the first phase, they have to attend core every week for two months. In phase two, it's every other week for two months. And phase three is once a month for four months. Um, and each parent that comes into CPS, if they have a substance abuse issue, they are required to observe a session of our family drug court. Um, once they observe, we then fill out, um, or they fill out some paperwork. Um, and if they're interested in our program, they then contact us and we set up an intake with them. Once um, I meet with everyone um, when they first want to join, and then I will schedule them to meet with our recovery support specialist and then also with our case specialist. So it's quite a process. It's about a five-hour process over about two weeks. Um, once everything is completed, the, we then have the client officially welcomed into family drug court by the judge. Um, there, there are processes in our family drug court in regards to when someone is getting ready to phase up to the next level. Um, we have uh, phasing packets, and in those phasing packets they include our recovery plan, um, there's reflection questions. Um, our parents have to write letters to their addiction, to their children, and to their spouse. Uh, not necessarily that they have to send those letters to their children, of course, um, but this is just so that they're able to really understand, uh, you know, their addiction and how it's affected not only themselves but their family. Um, we also have um, a Family Drug Corps alumni group that meets once a month that we ask um, our parents to attend. We also um, ask them to complete a urinalysis and before graduation they are required to take a hair test. And in order to face each level, um, each parent has to take their packet with them to their treatment case manager, their individual therapist, also to their recovery support specialist so that everyone has signed off on the packet um, before they get to phase up to the next level. Some of the services that we provide in family drug court to our parents are, of course, our certified recovery support specialist. Each parent that comes into family drug court is assigned a recovery support specialist. We do have um, Andy. He's our only male recovery support specialist right now. Um, so he is um, assigned to all of the males, and we have three women. Um, other services that we provide are trauma-specific individual therapy, Celebrating Families, which is a program for parents whose children are over four. Um, and, the, and this program, they meet once a week, and they all sit down and have dinner together. Um, and then after dinner, the parents go into their um, their group and the children go into their age appropriate group. Also we have the, which I mentioned earlier, the monthly um, Family Drug Court alumni meeting and we also have our peer mentor support um, program which we are getting off the ground um, as we speak. So here's our team right now. Um, we have, there's five of us, and we do have one more person starting with us on March 17th. Um, it is, this is our team, it's small, but it is definitely mighty. Um, and um, the, the recovery support specialists uh, come from all different ranges of life, uh, experience different things, things in life, and um, they all have a different story to tell. So, and on that note, Andy? Good afternoon, everyone. We're a group of individuals who have had personal experience with substance use, alcohol use, mental health, CPS involvement, and or legal issues. Um, this is a, a picture of me, um, courtesy of uh, the Arizona Department of Corrections. Um, from the time I was 11 to the time I was 34, I used some kind of mind-altering substance. So basically, that's from 1982 to 2003 or five, I should say. I, um, I received, after uh, um, leaving the Arizona Department of Corrections, I continued to use for two more years. In August 12th of 2005, I entered rehab. And I, was, I remained in rehab for one year. 
and during that time, I participated in, in the Recovery Support Specialist Institute, and I went to a community college, Pima Community College here in town, and I received a, a certification in substance abuse. And it became clear to me as I started to look for work that these legal issues and this baggage was going to be a barrier for me. Um, I was able to gain employment in various behavioral health agencies due to my schooling, my own personal experience, and the RSS Institute, but I was always going to, my experience was that I was not going to be able to move up if I didn't get some of these things cleared off of my record. Um, in 2011, I became kinship foster placement for um, a young lady who was in family drug court, and that's how family drug court found me. Um, I met Mo, and Mo said they had an uh, opening, and she asked me to fill an application out, and I explained the process of my felonies and the things that were going on with me, and Mo said, let's just get the ball rolling. And that's what I did. I petitioned the judge in superior court here to have my uh, um, felonies reduced to misdemeanors, and it's ironic because drug court wanted to hire me for my experiences, but those experiences are what was in the of not allowing me to be hired. So I've got to learn the system really well. And also, I also got to get my, uh, my fingerprint clearance card with the reduction in felonies. My, my road to recovery has been long, um, but this picture here is of my family. On adoption day, we, the, the, we, we adopted the sibling pair, the two younger, that's my, four, all four of my children and my wife, and one of the, the judge who performed our adoption. Um, I'm glad to say that today I'm able to use my experience, strength, and hope and pass it on to the participants that participate in family drill court. And in doing so, we get to create hope, self-esteem, and self-confidence in the parents that we serve. I'm now going to turn it over to Yesenia, our senior RSS. Hi, everybody. So this lovely picture is the picture that was taken in March of 2004 when I first joined family drill court. Um, this was two years into my CPS case. I had two CPS cases, the first one which was opened in 2002 as a result of my crack cocaine addiction. And um, my first, the first time I was involved in CPS was during that time where the pilot program was happening, so I wasn't able to take advantage of the drug court program. But during my, my first time, you know, my, my mindset, like uh, Tiana said, I wasn't ready, and I didn't think that I had a problem. I didn't think that I didn't think anything was wrong with me, and I just went through the motions of doing my CPS case, which in the end I lost custody of my oldest son and my oldest daughter, and which so this happens a lot. And I was one of those as I got pregnant in the middle of my CPS case, and um, I continued to, to use. I, I relapsed when I was seven months pregnant with my daughter, and at uh, two days old from the hospital, my third child was removed from CPS. And that was in October of 2003. And again, still not ready. It took me from October 2003 until March of 2004 when I finally joined drug court that um, I began to start doing things that I knew were the right steps in order to help me recover. But um, I graduated family drug court in May of 2005, so like Mo said, our program is a minimum of eight months. I took a little bit longer than that. Uh, my first month in family drug court, again, like it was said earlier, you know, when we first come into recovery, we start thinking, you know, no one believes in us, or if I stop going to these classes, and these people will give up on me just like everybody else has. And so that was my, that was, how I thought, and I, for the first month in, in drug court, I kept using, but I would call them every day, and I would tell them, like, I'm getting high, I'm not going to court today, I'm not going to the group today, and I thought, if I call them enough, then they'll just kick me out, and then I can blame it on them, you know, everybody else gave up on me, they gave up on me, so I have no hope, but um, that didn't happen, they kept answering, and they kept encouraging me, and uh, a month after I joined drug court, I went into treatment, and a year Almost a year and a half after my daughter was removed, she was returned home to me, and today I have custody of all four of my children. And so when I, um, my voice gets cracky because it always brings tears, I'm sorry. Um, but after I graduated drug court, I felt so connected to the, to the team that I thought, well, I'm not letting them go, so I bugged them at least once or twice a month just to check in with them. And 
started going to school. I went back to get my GED. And uh, right now, I'm currently a, a student at the University of Phoenix. And um, in 2010, you know, because I would go and speak in different venues for drug court to share my story and how it worked and what, what they did for me. And in 2010, the RSS position was opened. And I'm so grateful that I got the position. And just recently, in December of last year, I was promoted to senior recovery support specialist. Um, this is my beautiful family that I have. It would be a, a place. There they are. Yeah. So that's my husband and my four kids. Um, you know, my older kids, they, they know, they know what, what happened. You know, obviously they had a lot of questions and, and, and my younger kids, my, my baby, which is in the black shirt there, she, she wondered why I didn't fight for her and I had to explain to her, you know, why I didn't fight for her and that it's a good thing that I didn't have to. Um, today what I do to keep myself, you know, still in the, in, in recovery and still keep myself stable for myself is, is, is self-care. I have still my support team. I open up here at, at, at work. You know, if I'm struggling with something, you know, I feel comfortable with my team that I can come to more. I can come to my program manager and say, hey, this is what I'm going through. And I have that support where, you know, I won't feel like they're going to judge me. And, and, you know, we're still a team. So we're always helping each other to make sure that we're all well in order for us to go and help others get well. Uh, one of the questions that came up was what are the roles and how, what's the difference between a case specialist and a recovery support specialist? So a way that we like to say it is that the case specialist is in contact with all the treatment providers, CPS, and the judges to make sure that everything that needs to get done by the parent is, is put in place. So sometimes there's service gaps or sometimes the parents can't get in contact with their CPS workers. So that's where our case specialists come in to make sure the referrals are happening and collaborate with all the team to make sure that all the other parties are doing their part in order for the parent to be successful. As uh, RSS is, what we do is we do the first part of the intake, which is going over their substance abuse history. And that's something that we just started about a year ago. And the reason why we, we feel that it's beneficial for us to do it that way is because a lot of people I know for myself when I first came in I was very reserved I had my walls up and I wasn't going to let anybody in but putting the RSS's to be the first ones that they meet with to talk about their substance abuse history it really breaks down those barriers because we're able to tell them you know we understand why you're here and let us tell you what our role is and who we are and we don't go into deep detail about our, our, our story. For instance, I let them know, like, you know, I'm a drug court graduate, and I'm a survivor of two CPS case plans, and I'll be clean for 10 years. And so that right there just starts giving them that glimpse of hope. We also go over the recovery plans. We, um, and in the recovery plans, we ask questions like, what are, what's your motivation? What are your goals? And what we try to focus on is there are so many other people that they're dealing with on a daily basis talking about substance abuse and why it's not good and, you know, all that stuff that as recovery support specialists, we talk about the same thing, but we also try to help them see that there's life after CPS, there's life after drug court, and there's more to life than just always thinking about, well, what's going to trigger me? I can't go to that location. So we start asking them, well, do you want to finish school? Do you need help getting a job? Like other things that can help establish their foundation, which, um, you know, includes legal issues. Um, helping them get to some outside meetings and also, like I said, still identifying the, the cravings and, and how to avoid relapses. Some of the essential functions that we also provide are, are the number one thing we do is peer support. And peer support includes attending court hearings, not only here at the juvenile court center, but also um, the superior courts, justice courts, and city courts. When I began working for drug court two years ago, um, the homeless court through city court was in place. I make monthly referrals for our clients to that court. But in the process of going to that court, a lot of the times the judge would reinstate their license there, but then they have stuff in Superior Court, they have stuff in Justice Court. So I was able to build a connection and a bridge with the, the Tucson, um, South Tucson courts, which have now has a homeless court. I was also able to build a bridge with Justice Court. And um, I attend hearings with them at Superior Court, 
And in building these bridges, I'm also helping to increase self-esteem and self-confidence in our clients because when they start to participate in their court hearings and do the community service, which then helps to reduce fines, which then um, the judge will quash warrants and take fines out of collection. And it helps to build confidence within themselves so that they begin to see, hey, this is possible. Um, last Friday, I was very, very blessed to um, attend a, a, a a court hearing for one of my participants who, after 13 years, was able to get his license back, something that he ran from because he didn't know how to begin the process. He didn't know where to start. He didn't understand that it was possible. And um, he was thanking me and, and saying, you know, thank you for all the help. And I explained to him, I'm like, you did the work. This is what you did. We just pointed you in the right direction. We supported you in that direction. I'm also um, helping to work with a mental health court because we have seen an influx of clients coming from the mental health um, arena. So now we are, uh, I'm working with the judge here in Tucson City Court and one in Superior Court to try and uh, um, get our clients enrolled in those courts to help them also. We also, uh, we also participate in uh, weekly staffing. Um, our slides are not moving forward, so I'm just going to go ahead and move forward. Um, we participate in weekly staffing, and at those weekly staffing, um, we, as RSSs, we are able to give um, our input and our reports to CPS who attends. We also give to the treatment providers, the judge. All of these people are in one room to, to um, share and talk about our, 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 our clients and, and our participants and help to facilitate what we're doing. Um, we also assist, as, as Yesenia talked about, um, on the recovery plans, because recovery plans is what we give them when they graduate. They take these with them, this is what they've worked hard on it, and they put a lot of thought, energy, blood, sweat, and tears, as we call it, because that's, they're reliving and bringing up a lot of the past, and we are helping them to walk through that without fear. Um, we also do um, home visits every week, and part of doing that is sometimes we run into to clients, you know, who, who, as Tiana said earlier, fall off, they, they begin to, lose, you know, lose hope and courage, and so we'll go out and we'll do an announcement business. We'll show up at their treatment providers. We'll help to get them re-engaged not only with FDC, but also the treatment, also with their visits and, and with CPS. And we make it very clear that we are not here to bust you or try and find something on you. We're here to help you. We also provide um, bus passes when necessary um, for the first six months, um, and we also transport when needed. We'll transport to CFTs, ARTs, adult recovery team meetings, child and family team meetings, court hearings, and those types of things. So, in in the hiring process, some of the some of the skills, knowledge, and experience that that uh, we look for is sustained recovery from addiction. So, we ask for a minimum of five years, and we believe that after five years, we you know have a pretty firm foundation and we have the knowledge of the signs and the symptoms of relapse and we're able to, you know, better, we're better equipped to come in and, and help someone else once, you know, most of our junk is, is dealt with because um, that's always, you know, I've been clean for almost 10 years and there's still stuff that I'm processing. The other thing is empathy. Because we've been there, done that, we're able to come alongside the clients when they are having a tough time and they are feeling like there is no hope. And, you know, uh, like Tiana said, you know, just recently there's been at least three or four moms that have come to me and said, I don't feel that I deserve, that my kids deserve me, you know. And usually, you know, in the four years that I've been working here, questions have been asked to me and I've been able to, you know, share my experience, strength, and hope. But about a month ago, uh, uh, one of the participants had just relapsed and she and she looked me straight in the eye and she asked me, she was like, did you ever feel that you weren't worthy of parenting your kids? And uh, I'll be honest with you, is she, she broke me, you know, and, and tears did come out and I shared with her, you know, I did feel the same way. But you know what? I kept going forward and I shared with her and she asked me, you know, what did you do as we st stood outside of detox? You know, what did you do all those years ago? What was the first thing that you did that got you where you're at today? And I said, I was right here at Detox just like you are. You know, so the, the empathy piece is huge. Um, also, you know, when we are talking to the clients, it's not, 
this is what you should do, or why aren't you doing this, or you're going to lose your kids, because before drug court, that's all I ever heard from CPS. And so here it's more, you know, the am I, you know, reflections, and, you know, how is that, you know, how are your choices going to benefit you, and, you know, what are some of the consequences, positive or negative, that could come of it. The crisis intervention, so that can be anything. It could be they call us and say they feel like using, or a family member passed away, or, you know, a visit fell through, you know, the, a no call, no show, so they're freaking out, they're worried about their child, or, you know, anything that the any type of crisis, and sometimes the smallest things are a crisis to them. And we have to, we're there to remind them that, you know, it's not the end of the world, you know, um, that you missed the bus or whatever it is, and try to help them, you know, bring them back to what's important and how to move forward. Um, we do deal with uh, different cultural backgrounds, and so we are sensitive to that. And when, you know, in our intake, when we talk to them about, you know, their history and where they come from, then we're able to refer them to different groups, whether it's for Native Americans, gender-specific group meetings, Spanish-speaking, or, you know, some of these um, support meetings that are, you know, faith-based. So, as Tiana said, you know, we do share our experience, strength, and hope, and yes, timing is everything. Um, and it's also on a need-to-know basis, so we don't go in and glorify anything. Um, like I said, me personally, when I share my, my story, I, I let them know that, you know, I didn't think there was hope, and I share with them how the impact that drug court made for me, you know, that I believed that they believed. I didn't believe that I could do anything, but for whatever reason, they believed that I could do it, so I was just going to trust them. And I share that with them, and that gives them hope. Um, and also, you know, I chose a man over my kids, and that didn't go so well. I lost, you know, custody of my older two kids, and sometimes when females come in here and that's what they're struggling with, I let them know, you know, I'm going to share with you what I did and some things that worked for me and some things that didn't work for me, and I'm hoping that you can learn from my mistakes. Um, but at the same time, you know, not everybody recovers in the same way, so some things that might have worked for me might not work for them. So I'm never, we're never pushing anything on them. We just give them the different available resources out there, the different paths, and then let them choose. And then we walk alongside them and support them in, in, in the path that they choose. Another thing that we work on really well here is boundaries. Um, because we may know what a healthy boundary is, but our, 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 the people that we serve may not. Um, a lot of times they don't even understand what that is, whether it's relationships, even with their children. Um, so we have to be the professional, and in being the professionals, we, we, we tell them from the very beginning when we do our first intake is we are going to report both sides of the spectrum. When you're doing really well, we're going to say that. When you need to step it up, we're going to say that as well. And these are things that they understand clearly from the beginning. Um, I've, uh, for me, when I uh, became an employee of family drug court, I was, the mom was in drug court, so I was I, we kept the boundary. I, I would leave courtroom. I wouldn't participate in, in anything that she had going on that day during court. And that's the professional boundary we have to keep as, as recovery support specialists. The pros and cons of spending a lot of time with a client, the way I explain it to, to the guys and some of the ladies that I work with is in the beginning, we are going to spend some time with you because we're trying to get you your feet under you. We're giving you that foundation. But as you face a level two and three and as you start building your own resources in the community and you start to believe in yourself, we, we spend less time with you, but we're still here to support you and walk this walk with you. Well, I want to first of all thank um, both Yesenia and Andy uh, for being a part of this webinar today. Um, you know, we're here to believe in our clients until they can start believing in themselves. Um, this is the link here to the institute that both Andy and Yesenia um, and actually the, and, the, and Susan and Kay, our other um, RSSs, attended and are certified through. Um, and as you heard, our recovery support specialists are a vital part of our program. Um, you know, it gives the parents hope when they don't have it and, it, and they have the help when they, when they feel helpless. Um, and we do continue to provide on-point training to all of our staff, uh, specifically um, 
trauma train, train, whoa, trauma training, um, as well as vicarious trauma. We're going to be starting that. Um, we do continue to attend motivational interview and trainings because that's a big part of what we use. Um, and we also um, find out what's new in the drug world, so to speak, in regards to synthetic drugs that are being um, made. And we also do training on mental health because we mental illness because we do find that um, it definitely goes hand in hand with substance abuse uh, for a lot of our parents. Um, so some of the opportunities for our Family Drug Court graduates, they're able to participate in the Family Drug Court alumni group. Um, this group actually meets uh, once a month, and what they do is all the parents get together um, and they decide on where they're going to go for an outing. Um, they can bring their children, and there are um, daycare available for the children. Also, um, so then what they do is once they decide where they're going to go, they then wait another two weeks, and then they go out and they'll like go to the zoo, or they'll have a picnic in the park, or they'll go to our desert museum here. Um, some of the other opportunities is becoming a family drug court peer mentor, which is after they've graduated and after their case is closed, um, we can assign a peer mentor to a brand new parent that's just coming into our program to help that parent navigate through the system as well. Um, they also have the opportunity to attend the RSS Institute and also the opportunity to um, actually you know, be, in, be in the profession and um, become a senior RSS just like the offender did. Okay, so here's the impact um, since hiring recovery support specialists that we have found since 2010. The graduation rate through 2011 went from 37% to 53%. That's huge. Um, the reunification rate through 2011 went from 52 to 82%. So what happens is the impact of having of hiring recovery support specialists is that the parents, they feel comfortable when they find out that there is someone here that has walked in their shoes uh, understands where their fear is coming from, um, they begin to trust again. And sometimes that takes a little bit of time, but eventually they do. They begin to trust again, and they begin to open up. And that's when we are able to find out exactly what kind of services they need. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, we, we try to really individualize it to the parent and the family. Um, so, if you are interested in finding out more about Yesenia and Andy's story, I'm trying to click, here we go. There's a blog down here, Family Drug Court. Um, there's a couple of Arizona Daily Star articles that feature Yesenia and Andy. Um, and also, um, Yesenia was a participant in the Parade of Transformation at the 2012 NADCP. So I just want to say thank you to everyone for listening. I'm sorry about the slides kind of being slow. I'm not sure what happened. Um, but I just want to say thank you, and thanks especially to my wonderful team. You guys rock. And uh, we're going to take it back to CFF and Dr. Young. Thank you so much, uh, Maureen, Andy, and Yusenia. That was truly inspirational. We appreciate you sharing with us. Uh, we have about five minutes left. I want to just draw your attention to the remaining of the PowerPoint slides for various resources that are available to you all uh, related to this topic. But want to turn things over to uh, Russ Bermejo for just a few minutes to ask a couple questions that came in. Uh, the remaining of the questions will be posted on the blog spot. Blog spot. There we go, and uh, get some answers to those. But but Russ, what do you've got right now? Yes, just to make sure um, Tiana and Pima online. Yes, yes, we are been tracking um, the questions that have been coming in, and one question is actually two parts. Are any of the recovery um, specialists currently pres prescribe medication for drug dependence, and does your no. family drug court allow clients with medical assistant treatment? No. Oh, the clients, yeah, we, our, our parents, the clients that come in, yes, um, they can be on methadone or suboxone, not the medical marijuana. Um, as far as our recovery support specialists, um, we don't, we don't, um, they're not on any prescribed medication for drug dependence. And the same is true for Sacramento County, although clients 
can um, take methadone and Suboxone. Um, they cannot take medical marijuana. And we also have it to where they cannot be on um, prescribed opiates while in our program as well because that is such a huge problem. And But as far as recovery specialists, um, they may be on psychiatric medication, but nothing that would um, be on drug dependence. No. Thank you. We also received a few questions regarding caseload assignment and workload. So one of the questions was, can you tell how many clients um, you work on a daily basis? So this is um, for the recovery specialist, especially if you're attending court, completing the substance abuse section of assessment and other duties. Um, well, for Sacramento County, County um, the caseload sizes are pretty large. Um, for our early intervention family drug court, which is a separate court, um, they they have the kids in their home, and so the caseload sizes are about 18 to 20 per recovery specialist. And for our dependency drug court side, um, the recovery specialist holds a 20 to 25 person caseload. Thanks, Tiana. Well, well here, here, here in Dima, um, I have, uh, I've had up to 20 on my case, 10, 20 men. Currently I have 12, and I can see anywhere from four to five in, in, in one day, depending on what I have planned that day. Um, I can see up to six or seven when we go to homeless court. Um, I do do um, court hearings individually with them when, they, when they're when asked to come to Superior Court, Justice Court, those types of things. But for the men, it, it's a little bit lower than it is for the women, and I'll let Yesenia speak on the women. So our caseload is, ideally, we, we want no more than 15. Um, right now, I think we're averaging, you know, 15 to 20. Um, and like Andy said, what we do is our, our weeks run from Thursday to Monday. And so we, we see an average of four to five times a day. Just like, uh, and we take anywhere, and we dedicate, we try to dedicate an hour each, but, you know, at the minimum, half an hour per client. Thank you, Pima. Um, one question regarding assessment forms or tools. Do you use um, an assessment type form or do you just have a conversation with the participants about their drug use? We do, we do the game. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we use the, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say we use, we use the, like you said, we use the game and that's a pretty intensive tool. Um, and like they were, uh, Yesenia was mentioned earlier, um, uh, the RSSs do the substance abuse part, which normally takes about two hours. Um, and then the case specialist, the following week, will then finish off the rest of the game, which covers, um, you know, more personal about relationships and childhood. And then we ask the, the parent to actually sit down on the computer and fill out the rest of the game, which includes uh, work history, um, school history, um, employment history, and so that normally takes about two hours as well. So it's, it's a pretty intense um, tool. Thank you, Maureen. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, so again, um, we will, the questions that we weren't able to, we will post those on our blog for a response from our presenters. So thank you again for your participation. Thank you, thank you. and thanks for all the Children and Family Futures staff who made the webinar possible today. We look forward to hearing from many of you and hope that you are able to participate with us in our next webinar on April 10th about refinancing and redirection sustainability planning in your FDC. Um, with that, we will close off. Thanks again, and we look forward to hearing from you.